I would like to invite the speakers who are still in the room, if they could come on the stage. Yeah, please. Russ, if you were mind. Yeah. Um, for those who don't have mics, uh, you can either stand here or we'll give you one. I get one back. Okay. Don't, you don't need to be shy. Interesting. The only question I got uh, was actually with regards to DDoS mitigation, v6 DDoS mitigation. So what is the consideration for IPv6 DDoS mitigation? So we heard about your struggles for the out outgoing traffic and we heard about implementing really support on the infrastructure. But do you have any other thoughts? You don't, you don't have uh, I, think, I think basically my thoughts were on there. It's just like... It's, it sounds like some people are trying to do it, but not really very many people, and um, not very many people seem to be seeing it at the moment, but I am, so that's basically my... Uh, I'm interested to hear what your experience with actual DOSs is, is on V6, if there is any. I definitely have an experience, and, and I'll try and recount this experience. A couple of years ago, um, when we, we first started using this mitigation platform, uh, in, in this way and being able to do V6 is that I was sitting in the office uh, and somebody said, oh, we've got a DOS, it's V6, come and look. Well, everybody crowded around, yes, it's definitely V6, excellent. What is it? Ah, oh, uh, some random address or something. It's going to some address that's not configured, we, it's not even configured, it's not even a customer. And we're like, ah, oh, <laughs> false alarm. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's largely been, we've had a handful of them that I can remember um, that are at any serious sort of rate. Um, and I think, I even think it classified our genuine DNS traffic as an attack at one point because it wasn't expecting to see as much V6 towards a certain, a single host. So um, I, I think, you know, I, I do seem to remember this uh, because we do things like putting 53 in the address of the name server so we can recognise them instantly if they're in our infrastructure um, uh, networks. And, oh, that's, you know, the name server. Oh, no, that's genuine traffic. Oh, why is it being, oh, yes, it's not seen as much V6 towards it before. Right, yeah, I have to retune that. So this kind of thing. Um, have I seen any really large V6 attacks? I don't know, I've seen maybe... 80 meg, 100 meg at one point. Um, and I think that was someone copying a file, perhaps. <laughs> I think so. I'm not entirely sure. It was some, it was some cloud provider. To, it was some cloud provider to some customer server on a port that was, I think, a, a SMB or something like this. And, and, uh, and it said, oh, maybe this is a false alarm. I won't touch it. And just left it at that. No, I can't think of any more. <laughs> no. General questions then, yes. if any have got any questions for our yes. illustrious panel. I can see a couple of hands here that will be next. Three. This, is, this is a really silly one. Should Dave host the IRC guy to test his system? So. Well, maybe we'll have a talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a test customer. Go ahead. That's, that sounds like a good question for the pub later. Uh, so, as a as a general question, um, we've heard quite a lot today about um, uh, scanning and reconnaissance of IPv6, and, and whether it's you know uh, harder or, or, or methods where it's not quite so hard. And I wondered um, if you had any more thoughts about the the sort of line between um, making life difficult for attackers um, by you know by by choosing addressing schemes in that sense, and the um, more, more sort of legitimate sort of discovery that we were talking about earlier, where uh, internally uh, you want to keep track of your your assets and understand what you have and, and how to handle that. And, and I guess I wondered what your thoughts were on the, the sort of the balance between those two things. This one works. Uh, for some stuff, you must you might use like addresses that are not predictable, and then you can use uh, dynamic dynamic DNS updates. That's something that you can do. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that you I mean it's not what I would say is uh, something that I recommend, but you can uh, come up with patterns that are not so evident. 
I mean, it's something that uh, for you it might be obvious, but it's not so obvious no. from the outside. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, your question touched on the management of this. So all of you will have governance obligations, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and the like, and also possibly IPv6 forensics. So you need to know who has which address at what point. So yes, by all means, as Fernando said, use the opaque addresses, use the temporary addresses, but you actually need to have an accurate log of all of those legitimate addresses. And that's not as straightforward as it should be. Um, so there are a whole host of, and I'm sure you're familiar with the, the DDI products out there that will claim to be able to tell you all of the addresses that you have within your network, but they don't. Um, so the most effective way, I think you guys would probably agree with me, is to scrape the neighbour discovery messages from your LAN infrastructure, which you think would be a simple feature to do, but it's yeah. not. <laughs> Maybe David wants to add to that. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I just just add to that, and in the you know there are many sources of this. So the the talk right at the start of the day about uh, taking them from your corporate proxy server. That's a that's a good example. Um, with a relatively common uh, wireless LAN management system, um, every time uh, a, a, a user or station on on the wireless network wants to go and generate itself an address or do whatever it wants, we've got a record of that. Um, We've obviously got flow telemetry if we wanted to analyze what's going on in particular networks and figure out which addresses are actually being used. Um, but uh, I, would, I would always advocate the managed DHCPv6 um, environment simply because it gives you the greatest degree of control um, and lets you and, and, and really gives you the visibility of the Mac without having to do any of the ND snooping. Um, provided that the, the I, I put that link up to 6939, but provided the relaying pieces are, are properly, you know, that the client address is actually passed on in the in the uh, request, then you've got a, you've got the requester's MAC address, and you don't have to deploy that on the switch network. Okay, there are a couple of questions down here somewhere. Uh, oh, Peter. Peter, by the way, is the person that brought IP to the UK in the first place. So. Um, <laughs> Should be a good question. Well, relative to that, in the old days, one either obeyed uh, the standards and were, compa and were uh, or you didn't. Now, from what we've been hearing today, there are a number of places where you might support X or you might not support Y, and it might work or it might not work. Do the uh, service providers actually say what aspects of the packet is supported or the network uh, supports or doesn't support? <laughs> in, in the UK, we have the regulators which do that for us, <laughs> which is all I will say, being in this building. <laughs> Are there any other comments or next question? Okay, I think Nick, was it? Um, with uh, IPv6 starting to get rolled out in, in the UK and the world in general, what do you think are the most common security vulnerabilities that we're going to start seeing? At, or uh, uh, the types of attacks you might start to see that are v6 specific? Um, so I'd say most of the problems that I expect to see is from, uh, from actually from uh, people enable, enabling B6. For example, I've seen in many cases where people end up enabling B6 without much knowing what they are doing. So that could be anything. Uh, if you, let's say, didn't know enough to, uh, that you had to rely on some recipe to actually get it, work, get it to work uh, from the point of view of security, that's terrible. Uh, what I would expect to start to see uh, is more scanning attacks. In a sense, I was kind of like frustrated that uh, there were no reports at all. And there's actually the other guy that did the other, um, I, I actually, I don't remember if that was official or not, but the thing was that uh, on the IPC hackers main list, uh, there was a report about a, a scanning attack. I think it was on that list. And it was right after the other guy, Mark Oitze, he released uh, one of the scanning tools. 
So from his perspective, it was kind of like a proof of success of the, <laughs> of the tool because it started to be used. But yeah, I, I, um, I guess that you know, still nowadays, uh, attackers mostly rely on the B4 stuff because it's, let's say, easier. And if you look at, for example, the kind of tools that you traditionally use for doing uh, you know, address scans, like Nmap, they don't have much support for B6. Like even like a while ago, you could do like um, port scanning, but you couldn't actually do address scans. And nowadays, it's last, last time that I checked, the support that they have for address scans is you can just specify a prefix, but that's not that useful for B6. So I guess that you know, as, you know, people have to rely more on B6, and you know, also most of the tools, uh, you know, improve the support that they have for B6. You, you, we will start to see more things. I also remember a conversation with um, guys from a company that, well, most of their business is, business is about uh, producing a penetration testing tool, and they were saying like, you know, we have all this machinery for before like, you know, plugs that they can run and so on. But for V6, the problem that they had was that they couldn't find the systems in the first place. So I guess that, you know, as soon as they, you know, solve that part, maybe you start seeing people trying to, you know, uh, you know, exploit stuff. But uh, that's like first problem that they were facing. Just want to just add to that quickly and say that um, one thing that we've noticed with customers in, in uh, uh, deploying V6 is that they traditionally, and this is a really old problem and not new to anybody, um, relying on the security of a V4 NAT, deploying V6, finding out that all of their branches and offices and you know even the toilets have publicly routable addresses with no security. Um, and I must take my hat off to people like Amazon who, uh, when they did their V6 rollout to their uh, VM service to EC2, um, actually recommend customers when they deploy use a configuration which filters everything inbound. Um, and that's one of the few providers I've seen actually take that initiative um, in a in a standalone fashion, like without having to be handheld to it, the, the customers are literally told when you deploy it, you deploy it like this with this type of gateway that doesn't allow any inbound traffic. And if you really do want inbound traffic, then you'll have to do it yourself and configure the security. And and the the first time that I've seen that at such a lot happen at large scale, I must take my hat off to them um, because I suspect that if they didn't do that, things would be everybody would be in a really bad place right now. Yeah, so at that point I was at the presentation by the guys from Comcast a couple of few years ago, and they were uh, mentioning that when they would deploy IPv6, they would essentially, you know, the same uh, part of the topology where you would put an ad box, they would deploy a firewall that would only allow outgoing communications, same stuff that you were mentioning. And I was curious about if, whether that had just happened or there was actually a conscious decision. So I asked the guy, like, you know, once he was off stage, and um, they mentioned that for me that was like the right thing to do. They said, well, you know, nowadays, whether you like it or not, people expect that, you know, the network only allows outgoing communications. And uh, they say, well, we didn't want to, let, let's say, people associate or experience attacks that they were not experiencing with IP before. And I think that's a clever thing to do. That's my own perspective, but uh, I think that, um, you know, uh, quite often people assume that uh, because in IPv6 uh, you can have essentially as many global addresses as you want, that necessarily needs to imply that you have like uh, global connectivity like any to any. Uh, and I think that particularly when you talk about like stuff that you might have at home, like let's say your TV set. For me, there's no reason for which I would like anything on the internet to actually, you know, get back home. Uh, particularly when these devices, I mean, for so many different reasons, including the fact that usually they don't have, you know, good patches, and uh, with the kind of, uh, let's say, um, suboptimal devices, that would be like an educated way of saying that, suboptimal devices that you connect to the network, let's say if you start connecting more devices, there's going to be, a, you know, a point in which, like, well, your house gets infected and all out of the sun you have a fire at home, like all your food got ruined because somebody had your refrigerator and so on. <clears throat> I think that, uh, let's say I believe strongly that, you know, in the, let's say, principle of less privilege in that case, uh, even when applied to connectivity. So for stuff that you have on your network that mostly just needs to, let's say, consume stuff, there's no reason for which you should allow, like, anything. And based on the, you know, I have looked a little bit at you know some of the smart devices that you connect at home, like you know smart plugs, cameras, and so on, and it's insane. 
And in a sense, it's a miracle that people cannot get to them because the only way to protect them is like nobody should be able to talk to them. Uh, and if you were to you know allow like anything uh, as a data point, for example, not that long ago there was a, uh, you know there was a vulnerability advisory about uh, like an IPv6 version of Ping of Death, right? Now, when that used to happen, let's say in the 90s, well, I guess it didn't matter that much. But if you think about nowadays that you could be connecting anything and you know stuff in your home that might be actually controlling like real stuff, like motors, whatever that is, uh, if these devices were susceptible to that kind of uh, attacks, that would be terrible. And particularly, it's even worse if you can actually get attacked just because of this policy of oh, any to any. Uh, I don't think that's the right way to go, I, I, myself. I think, Fernando, there was an RFC 6092, Simple Security, which is default deny for residential <coughs> networks, yeah, but yeah. with a few exceptions like Ike and a yeah. few other things. I don't know what um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the Sky guys have disappeared from behind me. I don't know what Sky's um, default position is there. For clarity, I don't speak for Sky. Uh, <laughs> but fun fundamentally, when talking with various other providers that have rolled out uh, reasonable scale residential stuff. The principle of least pr surprise has to work. You pay a lot of money for support calls and people remember that you screwed them over if you break things and what have you. So given you're pushing it out, it's out to an uh, unsophisticated environment on a wild, wild west homeland to customers that don't even know it's coming or care, you have to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Uh, and this, that's the only sane starting point to, uh, to deploy to. Uh, uh, there was quite a lot of discussion about it, but I don't think any of the other variants, other than those that have been discussed uh, in Simple Security and various other forums, were ever seriously considered by any provider that I know of. Thanks, Ian. Okay, there's another question over on the right side. Can I see the hand up? There was a hand. Oh, there. Okay, there we go. Yes, I've been somewhat circumvented by the agreement that um, uh, default de uh, deny inbound replaces NAT, because it strikes me that the NAT that's been being discussed is solely about default deny inbound and, and solved by that. What I was going to say more generally was, though, several of the presentations we've had today have implied that there is something super secret about various surface characteristics of machines, um, IP numbers, MAC addresses, and so on. And yet, at the same time, several of you have also said that we shouldn't be worrying about IPv6 when it is producing problems which are already unsolved, open, existing issues for IPv4. We've already discussed that scanning is perfectly plausible on IPv4. Why do we have this obsession with IPv6 addresses being some sort of super secret dark information to be kept from the outside world? I mean, I was, I was discussing with Marcus earlier on, we could almost have a mailing list in which we all publish all the IP numbers of all of our machines as a sort of a transparency exercise to prove that we're not engaged in um, security through obscurity. So, so why is it that you think that IPv6 addresses are something that we should be worried? You've obviously put a lot of work into it, so you're obviously very concerned about IPv6 scanning. Why do I care? Well, one example, for example, um, let's say that... Uh, so, sorry, just for clarity, assuming I've got an inbound firewall which isn't utterly broken. I mean, that's... We, we so you, you are assuming that you have a... a yeah, so, we, so we're, we're assuming we have an inbound firewall, right, because it's 2017. In your so, own system. Yeah, in, in, uh, at, at some point that I control between me and the outside world. Well, let's, I mean, usually I have the, um, uh, I have the perspective that uh, when you do stuff that is wrong, one way or another, it's going to hit you sometime. So I prefer to fail on the you know, safe side. There are many reasons for that. Uh, I mean, there could be devices, for example, when you talk about the general case, in which uh, maybe you don't have that firewall that you're talking about. Like, it could be, in, I mean, it could be the case, let's say, in your laptop, if you want. But I don't know if that would be the case in your phone, for example. Uh, there could be other devices. So I prefer to always to stay on the safe side. And when it comes to the reason for which, um, why you should be concerned about that, well, first reason is that it's a bad idea. So if it's bad, so you, that, that, that strikes me as being proof by vigorous assertion. I mean, to say that something is a bad idea because it's a bad idea is a somewhat circular I can, give you, an circular I can give you an example. Let's compare things between before and B6, right? 
in IPv4, obviously because of the, you know, the address space, it's impossible for me to know where in the network you are just because of your address, because your address is going to be like shared with other people, for example. Now let's, uh, let's consider the IPv6 case. Let's say that I already know what your MAC address is. So I essentially know beforehand what's the address that you're going to get to whatever network that you connect to, okay? So if I know the prefix, for example, of your office, I know the prefix of the hotel where, are you, where you're going to stay and so on, I can essentially tell where you are just by coming up with the interface identifier and the prefix, and I just prove that, uh, and I just prove that address. That's an easy way to track you. I, okay, I just discussed it. I, I, don't, I don't understand why you regard that as being, in general terms, a severe attack. After all, face, Facebook quite happily produced the check-in mechanism, which all sorts of people use. I'll be connecting to Google in order to actually download my email. I'm not sure who the I in this context is. Anyone. Anyone. How? How? Well, <clears throat> how do you do the? How would you do the attack? Yes. It's, it's a privacy vulnerability, regardless of how you pay. No, no, but, no, but, but how, how, how are you asserting that you would actually be able to probe and fight? So if you know the hotel that I'm going to, so you say, okay, you, yeah. let's take your exact example. Yeah. You're saying you know my, the address of my office and the address of a hotel that I'm going to. <laughs> well, if you know the address of the hotel I'm going to, you know the hotel that I'm going to. So what you're saying is that given that you know the hotel I'm going to, you can find out the hotel that I'm going to. For, for example, no, no, no. Let's say, let, I can give you a so, so, no, hang on, no, I'm concrete, I'm just concrete, ex the concrete, concrete example. example. I go to an IETF meeting, right? I can get the MAC addresses of everyone there. Now for the next meeting, if I want to check if people is there at the meeting or not, if they are connected to the IETF network, I just ping the IETF prefix and the interface ID. It's that simple. Okay. Right. Okay. So, how so, do you do that in How do you do that in IP before? So, you can. but do I? But I don't care. Well, I think pe people do. I, but there's, there's and, and, and and actually, and as as our friend to the left points out, actually, I sniff the art packets off the network. From where? Well, that, you can do it remotely with V6. That's the thing. Whereas if, if there's no room. if there's no firewall in place. Okay. So so what you're essentially saying is that we cause, because otherwise what what's happening is what we're hearing from management is they're saying we can't deploy IPv6. Because a man has told me there are this long list of problems, and if we don't deal with them, the world will end. And, and if, we, if we're reduced to the level of arguing that you can find out which hotel people are staying in, given you know which hotel they're staying in, then I, then I, don't, I just think we are giving management a massive um, argument to not do IPv6 at all in exchange for incredibly edge case. So you're saying you can find out who's at the IETF people. Stand in the room and look around. Now you no, know no, who's at the The point is that you can do that first. First point is that you can do it remotely. Second, even if you use a firewall, you can still do it. Because you can, you get messages. If I send you a proof packet and your firewall in it, depending on whether your system is not, I'm going to get an ICMP error from the router connected to the local network or not. I would so just like to matter. suggest that this is an excellent topic for a pub conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because it could last indefinitely. Okay. Um, we've got about five minutes left. If it's a good topic, but has anyone else got, I wouldn't say a more serious question, it's still an important question, but anything else they want to raise? Let me, try to, let me make this comment that I don't see anything of the stuff that I discussed myself as a stopgap from deploying IPv6. Actually, I see it in a different way. Like, there's some stuff that can be improved, so while you are deploying it, there's stuff that we can take care about and try to improve it. It's not, I don't see that, that's why I did the disclaimer before the presentation, is that don't take anything of what I said as reasons not to deploy it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and that goes back to what I say, that a lot of those vulnerabilities are there in your network. Whether you've deployed or not, so it's there. Well made, but I think that's, that's mm. the part of the story which is not being told. People are seeing a long list mm. of alleged issues, a small disclaimer, and they're seeing the long list and not the disclaimer. Mm. Yes, yeah, that's fair comment. So there's a question in the middle here. Hi. Um, do any of you have any experience of added issues that people might experience by running IP3, IP6 through enterprise firewalls, like or with it being a relatively new protocol that people are using on some kit in some environments, are there undoubtedly added vulnerabilities and are there abilities to bypass the firewall in the IP6 world that they can't currently do in the IP4 world? 
That's a really wide topic because what you're basically saying are, are there any enterprise firewall vendors that have screwed up at any point? <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. I, I, I think, I think okay. because you'll find, you will find these people, you will find these things in V4 and, and, and really, you know, stateless, uh, stateful rather ALGs are a great example of, of you know, how, how things break when, you, when a structure or something changes and you can't parse it and you don't let go of RAM and then suddenly, you know, everything goes down. Um, th this sort of stuff happens all the time. In, ter in terms of V6, um, I can think of a particular vendor that um, had all of the V6 code by default turned off. If you wanted to turn it on, you set an environment variable and you reloaded the, the, the firewall and all of a sudden, you know, you had a default, you, had a, you used to have a default policy object that was any, and then when you reloaded the firewall, you got any v4 and any v6 and, and all of this stuff happened. Then if you decide you didn't quite like it, you wanted to turn it off, it, you, you were left with the corrupt policy object state and you couldn't do anything about it because there any v6 object existed, but it wasn't attached to something with a valid address family and everything was broken and, and you, you had to roll back the configuration. It was very painful and the customer got very unhappy with you. Um, but other than that, no, I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. I'll take it as a no then. Hi, yes. Um, we've talked a lot about the last 64 bits, the interface ID and security around that. Um, what about um, with residential broadband, say, um, pushing out slash 56s, um, which is a great idea and prefix delegation, et cetera, et cetera, is, is good. But is there any nuisance value in that to, to hackers, do you see, um, you know, with regards blacklisting of IP addresses and end systems not knowing whether they're seeing a, a single slash 64 or a collection of slash 64s that people can, can play around with? Um, you know, there's quite a lot of address space that they can play with there. If you remember, Nick, my slide with the different problems with um, IPv6 address uh, reputation, it doesn't matter if it's a slash 56 or whether it's a slash 48, you have the same problems today. The address reputation is an extremely difficult problem with IPv6. So I wasn't exactly sure if you had something more specific in mind from that. Because I don't think it's any different from residential as it is for, for any other, whether it's a slash 64, slash 56, or even possibly a slash 48. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I, just, I just have an anecdote about um, uh, early on when I first, uh, when we deployed V6 on our own broadband platform, of which I was a tester, um, and I had a very early piece of CPE, and I had a device that could do V6 and could do Slack, um, it was a camera of some sort and, uh, and I delegated a slash 48 to my home um, and I configured this delegation in the radius and then I went home and I connected um, and the entire prefix that was delegated uh, was sent by the CPE um, advertised in the RA with a slash 48 mask and I think the camera picked this up they tried to do slack with the 48 mask and promptly went impossible and crashed um, and uh, yeah, at this point, uh, I think that the um, the way that people configure delegation is supposedly that you get a chunk that's 56, I think is, is what's expected these days. You take the first 64 to be the default home network, and if you've got a relatively modern CPE, um, they'll configure a guest network with the second 64 and the wide network with the third 64. Those are predictable. If you know the boundaries of the 56, you can pretty much guess what the CPE is going to do with them when they carve them up. Um, Whilst it's configurable, it's not, you're not going to expect the end user to have to configure exactly where those subnet boundaries start. So yes, if you knew what the 56 boundaries were, you could probably find out how the delegation was being done and go for the first one, which is likely the default internal wireless LAN. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question, Nick? Or oh, were, were you thinking... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Sorry. Now, I'm now trying some ESP here. Uh, were you thinking in terms of is Slash 56 bad for residential users because it means they could be blacklisted with other residential users? Um, no, I was... <laughs> Thank you. 
I, I was just wondering whether there is a, an opportunity to create more nuisance because you've got bigger address space and that if there's things like rate limiting going on um, today, then it tends to be rate limiting on a particular address. Um, you know, if you've got you know, 16 bits of addresses, are you a botnet in, in the making just by the fact that you've got higher address space? Now, physically, it's going to be limited by, by your access speed, but you know, there might be some, some way of being a bit more of a nuisance than, than, than today, perhaps. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Well, I think you're right. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> but uh, but you, one would hope that you, with these standard subnet sizes, that providers who wish to do blacklisting, grey listing, rate limiting, take these into account. So, for example, um, RBL, so SMTP, most of the time it's done on 64 boundaries. I know a particular provider who, if they see traffic from adjacent 64s, will try and blacklist the 56. I've thankfully never got to the state where they've seen um, traffic from within adjacent 56s and done anything more, um, but I suspect they would probably go up one level as well. Um, I don't think they would go to the extent where they started targeting larger and larger subnets, um, mainly because they themselves don't know the, the impact on legitimate traffic. Um, with small RBLs, perhaps they're a bit more gung-ho in doing this, but for larger RBLs, um, trying to uh, get the balance between uh, not coming across as being useless for having bad data and actually providing a good service is important for them. So uh, I would assume that the RBLs that are relevant and matter would do this properly. I would have uh, expected that uh, it was very much almost universal that the concept of doing reputation to address or indeed many uh, acts of policy to an address is missing the point with v6 mostly it's prefix uh, there's quite a lot of work going on in other aspects that are pushing for slash 64 per host and other things it's becoming more and more prevalent and it's quite easy in say the ripe database to say exactly what the prefix size given to a residential pool is and a more complex RBL should be able to read from there and act accordingly without having to do guesswork heuristics. Uh, you combine that with uh, various other things, there's a way it could be a lot better than it is today uh, without having to do so much guesswork. That's an idealistic view, but we should be able to do better than what's been presented as the normal behaviour. When do you think it's going to be safe for me to recommend IPv6 to my grandmother? <laughs> Today. Um, do it now. Yeah. <laughs> because she will be safe, you know. She will have a CPE where the firewall's on, uh, adhering to these standards that we've mentioned, default blocking inbound traffic. So she'll be good. But she won't be able to buy anything that can talk to it. Oh. <laughs> I would add to that that at the North American IPv6 summit, um, is it, was it John Curran? It yeah. Was, yeah, he actually gave an excellent talk. Um, he's from Arin, and he gave an excellent talk about how we can actually encourage deployment of v6 by making v6 internet safer than what v4 is. Um, the talk is available on YouTube, so um, I would uh, recommend to everybody to actually have a look at it. I'd also say that the thing that Ian mentioned, the slash 64 per host, is interesting stuff. I think Comcast have been deploying that in their Wi-Fi networks in the States. The idea there is that every host gets a slash 64, so they're in their own, they get a, a link for themselves. So those sort of first hop issues aren't then an issue because the host is isolated. It provides that isolation. So it's not just about the reputation, it's about the isolation of the network that you're giving to a host in a shared environment. Um, and because you can uh, in V6. Yeah. So to the comment about the firewalls and issues that people have seen, my recent experience is that uh, often that's forgotten, <coughs> IPv6 is forgotten, you would be surprised in what types of organizations. We've always, now here today, focused really on the network infrastructure, 
We also need to think about the behavior of the end hosts. And nowadays, all the latest operating systems, they prefer v6. So they get dual stack connectivity. They connect to a resource in the cloud, which is dual stack as well. So they connect over v6. There's a firewall which blocks the connection. The application doesn't fall back onto v4. And then users um, really uh, report issues. And then we find out, yeah, it's the firewall uh, rules that were not really set up. Yeah, there, are, uh, there were at least two different studies. One was presented at an IPv6 hackers meeting that we had in Berlin in 2013, I think, by a guy from France, student from Mark Townsley, actually. So the study that they mm -hmm. did, uh, essentially they, I guess they port scanned so many sites on v4 and v6, and they tried to compare the policies, and they were different. Uh, I don't know if that study is uh, public, but there's another one with uh, one of the co-author was uh, Mark Allman, and they did exactly the same thing, and uh, same results. So you would expect, let's say, for whatever server you have out there, you have the same filtering policies, for example, when it comes to port numbers, but you don't. Uh, there could be many reasons. In some cases, it's that they just, maybe they fail to you know, configure, uh, let's say, the v6 firewall. I guess that in other cases, it might depend on you know how easy it is to set the same policy on both protocols. Let's say you might have a firewall product that you might expect like okay, if I filter this port, it doesn't matter which you know uh, internet protocol I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, but in many cases, if not most, uh, you have completely different configurations, so you have to do the configuration twice, and obviously that's prone to errors. Okay, I think we're. Five or ten minutes over the projected end time, so I think we can end there. Shall we have a round of applause for our panellists? Um, also, this meeting wouldn't have been possible without um, the generous donation of the facility and the food and the coffee um, from BT. Um, so thanks to Neil McRae and Nick Heatley for working on that, and also we're recording the session, so our camera person and the crew behind him in the, in the booth there who are handling all the, the, the behind the scene things is uh, really appreciated as well. So thank you to all of them. And of course, finally, thank you to all of you. I counted at the start, there's 118 bodies in the room and there's now 89 I just counted. So most of you have stood it to the bitter end. So thank you very much for that. So. As Veronica said, we're a, a volunteer organization. We're just doing this out of our own time and relying on the, you know, the generosity of people like PT to provide the facilities. So also, the, the council is only as good as the people that contribute to it. So Veronica did say we're going to have a, our annual meeting in October or November. We've got to decide the date. Um, but we'd very, very much be interested in hearing from any of you that have got you know, good stories to come and tell at that meeting. So if you want to come and talk for five, 10, 15, 30 minutes on a topic, please get in touch um, for that. But we'll put out information on that on the website and on the LinkedIn group, so stay tuned um, for that. Yeah, so I would just say with regards to the sponsorship and the annual event, even the, the question is really uh, a facility, a venue, right? Or sponsoring any refreshments for our, uh, for our attendees. And if not that, because you are a small organization, but you'll be interested in hosting a round table, which is a small scale, it's usually 20 people maximum, and it's a closed room conversation about various IPv6 topics and, and deployments, uh, please just get in touch. On the slides, you have seen, I believe, the link to the council website, ipv6.org.uk. There is a link to a LinkedIn group because that's the only way how we are organized. We've got now well over 500 members on the LinkedIn group, very few contributors, which is interesting. But people want to, at least there are people who want to receive the information, which is good. So that's where we kind of like broadcast or I would say multicast, because we've got subscribers. So we multicast the information about our events and what's happening in the V6 world. And there was one last thing. Yes, the pub. <laughs> Pied and Oster. Uh, yeah, it's the one across the road, apparently. So it's, it's got beer, it's good. Thank you for, your, for the great day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>